And let's see, that goes away. <coughs> hello. So, hello everyone, how are you all doing? Hopefully this is working away quite happily. Oh, good lord, that's gone down there. Um, currently having... Well, I've been putting up Christmas decorations today and that's why I'm running late. I got kind of sidetracked trying to... Well, I thought I had time to stick up one more string of lights outside the windows. Uh, I haven't quite got it how I like it, so I probably won't be posting a picture of them until... Judging by tradition, I will be still playing around with the lights and making sure that they are just perfect and just right still Thursday night. So um, it will probably be, there will be a picture posted before uh, uh, just before I go live on Thursday of me doing the very British version of lighting up my house. Didn't have to dangle from a ladder yet so far today. Uh, dangle from a tree for a bit, but not a ladder. Anyway, let's see who's been online and see who I have to say her, who I um, want to say hello to, who I should have been haven't said hello to yet and should do. Alistair Crow, hello. Come goes it, hello. John Shane, hello, Doctor. I finally finished Bill Trump's twenty eight and all the other podcasts as well as and for episode twenty six, I definitely agree with Steve George. B A I can't think I can't remember some reason, should be given the credit it needs for fixing major issues with the F-35, because whatever Lockheed misses, messes up, BA is uh, there to fix them. Then afterwards, BA turns into British naval captain and Lockheed into a naval lieutenant, and said naval captain has a little talk with said naval lieutenant on what I believe to be the naval version of said mess up, and yes, I know I misspelled mess in part one. Two part two. Ah, sounds cool. And hello, Constantinus. Hello... As a crowd, I went to the RF Museum, Royal Australian Air Force Museum in Perth on our recent holiday, and hello to the blessed Catalina and Lank. Oh, good lord, there's not another religion coming through here, is there? I, I, I counted three, you know. Ugh. This week's um, Bill Trump's tomorrow is going to be interesting on that regard. <sighs> Hello, Carl von Gersberg. Hello, Greg Sadowski. Hello, Cahedron. Hello, uh, Felix B. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> oh, hello from the Paddle Sleeping Country. Hello. Hello, Nautical Wolf. And there are some people who sent me some very nice messages on Discord I haven't yet got back to. I am very sorry. I know Melanie's one of them. Um, I will get back to you. I do apologize. I have just been... Well, I finished editing all the chapters I had on the book, so... That's all done, and this live was written today, and then the Christmas lights have been going up, and it's been... It's Christmas! Yay! It's the panic before Christmas. My theory about one of the reasons why Christmas is so happy for everyone is because they've done all, got all the panicking and stress out the way beforehand. Then there's only left for the fun bit on the day. The cooking. That's fun bit for me. I enjoy it. Old Richard, hello. Peter Dawes, Davison, Dawson, hello. DGB40, hello. DM Carlton, uh, Carpenter, hello. Vision, hello from grey and overcast, uh, snow snowbound upstate New York. Hello, and very cool emoticon, cloudy emoticon, very cool one. Hello, DGB40. Hello, shoot me. Hello, Stafford Thompson. I'll be needing Drax Flamethrower if he's not using it properly. Our lockdown starts on the 26th. <laughs> Yeah, we're in lockdown, but all but name. Um, God's announce, who is Bea Lenora? The very nice person who proposed this topic. Hello, Andrew Band. Possibly my misspelling of their name, but that's their name on the lovely thing that is Patron. Hello, Andrew, Andrew Bend. Hello from Overcast Central Alberta. Hello. Hello, Shane F. Hello, John Shea, and Agent screaming and throwing something at the wall. Uh, or any emergency iron brew stash. <laughs> Not quite that bad yet. Um, emergency iron brew stash. Uh, we have 12 bottles of iron brew in the garage. We have two bottles of iron brew sitting in my car. We have two bottles of iron brew sitting in my mom's car. <laughs> 
<laughs> we had two more sitting in my sister's car. My family's not worried about running out of iron brew for me at all. <laughs> uh, Jeff Beeler, remember, in 1889, no aircraft yet. It's Rule Britannia versus Unicall plus the Russians. Yeah, and the Germans, and the Italians, and the Americans, and everyone. Hello, Zachary Gherkin. In car, Aviate Enterprise, hello. Eleanor is here. Hello, Osprey28. Uh, no, I wasn't dealing with tech issues. I was running late due to lights, as I said. More volume, please. More volume. I think the volume's okay. I'm not sure. It's all... The mic's up on <laughs> maximum. So, uh, yeah. I can really do the volume on this one at the moment. So, hopefully it isn't the volume. Jeff Hill, I was reading up on the ships of the act. It's the eight, it's eight Royal Sovereigns versus the French sample fleet of seagoing hotels and the Russian sample fleet of foreign domestic signs. Yeah. John South, was this act ever actually repealed as Washington Treaty never went through Parliament? Mm, not really, but it was a very interesting act in that it was kind of self-defeating in terms of self-ending. Osprey 28, have you ever tried Yamon de Iberco? Um, I think you're talking about the very fancy Spanish ham and yes but i'm not trying it again this year because there's only gonna be three and i have me who doesn't mind eating anything but really objects to onions because frankly anytime he puts onions in food i for some reason end up with a plate full of onion and nothing else i do not know how it is if i put a single small shallot in a casserole, I will end up with every single piece of that shallot on my plate. I do not know how it happens. Uh, I have got my sister, who's gluten and dairy free. And I've got my mum, who has got a folder that thick of allergies from the lovely St. Guys and St. Thomas's, because she has allergy-induced asthma rather than proper asthma. And it makes for a lot of fun. So, basically, I am sticking to the very simple, so try and trusted turkey, gammon, bacon, chipolatas, mm, probably bacon cheese bites, a large number of them. Hello, William Cox. Hello, Earthborn Gnome. Hello, Jermac. Hello, Ben Laura, of course. How is Sean Mac? I love Bill Trump 26, and I'm glad to see Steve confirm what I've been saying for years, which is the F-35 is a fine aircraft, terrible procurement program. True. And honestly, we're going to have him back on again, because one of the interesting things with having had Steve on, and I'm diving into Bill Trump's when I know I'm supposed to be talking about the 18, uh, 1889 Act, and I will do. But um, one of the interesting things with having Steve on is after we've had him on, and after we had him on discuss what we're doing, we've had other engineers come on and go, well, you've listened to Steve out. And if Steve doesn't mind being there as well, we'd quite happily come on as well and talk some more about some of the areas we know. So pretty much it's kind of like having had Michael Clapp on. And now we've got Michael and Julian on for our Christmas special. And we had Jeremy on for, our, you know, our special sort of last week. <sighs> It's uh, Belge Pumps has got a reputation for we are not out there to be shock jocks or make fun of anyone or crucify anyone or try and trip them up. We're out there to ask questions and listen to the context and let people explain themselves. The only person who ever interrupts people probably is me, and that's usually me going, you can actually add more to that. Because usually, when I the only time I tend to interrupt people on it is, and I think actually Drac does this has done this a couple of times as well, is when we've heard people trying to basically going, oh, this lance will be too long winded. No, 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 we want to hear it. Shoot me! Can we start a war spike religion? I think that's probably only fair. 
Hello, James Hadley. Hello to Chili Lanc Lincolnshire. Wayne Borian. Hello, I haven't seen you before. Hello. Ah, a good afternoon all. Damn, I think I need to get my wine into this. I'm to shop and give me some iron brew. <laughs> iron brew is good for you. It is good for you. Keeps you going. Um. Mmm. <laughs> yeah, Osprey 28 is far too generous. I am. He's very, very kind. Very, very kind. <sighs> Although I, I have been joking with Drac that um, any lives we do before Christmas, we should go. It's Christmas. Tip your historian. <laughs> <laughs> but that was mainly him and me just joking away about the things. Right. Um, volume is fine. That's good. Peter doesn't already using our language, and it's not Xmas yet. I, I, you know, it, it, it happens to us all at some point. Um, I try and avoid the foul language as a rule, mainly because it's safer when you're around lots of little kids because they pick up things. Also, when you're around puppies, they don't like it. Oh, thank you, Alice Crew. Thank you. Very kind of you. Only half, uh, only half being serious earlier, oh, yeah, but thank you. My plan for Christmas is a lot of building work. Well, it was going to be a lot of building work. I, ha I had all the plans for the shelves drawn up, and I was going to try and buy the wood and all sorts of things. Uh, but, of course, the offices have been delayed. Ah, well. So... The 1889 Naval Defence Act. Why does it happen? Well, Britain has this thing called an empire. And it's quite large, even in 1889. And it's quite fancy. It, I mean, it really is fancy. We are the, you know, we are the bell of the bull. When we turn up places, they just love us. Not because they actually like us, but because they realize if they don't love us, then we're going to get very annoying and we might well send in some people to come and kick them in. It happens. It's, it's called naval diplomacy. Occasionally, we, we do blow up. And you, there have been various episodes I've done on Victorian versions of gunboat diplomacy, of blowing things up. Um, yeah, that is what the Royal Navy is. Very much there for. So imagine Britain as this how do I put it? Imagine the world's a high school. Okay? So the world's a sort of secondary school, high school. And imagine Britain is the superstar. I mean, they might not be the smartest. They might not be, they're probably the richest. They have a whole gang of friends, which they're the center of. They always end up, they might start a few fights. They might lose a few battles, but they tend to win the wars. They are the big person on campus. It doesn't matter. There will be other groups competing to be see who's the best in sports and who's the best in academia and all these things. Britain will always be in the top group of everything. And because of this, it actually has a sort of effortless primacy. So this is the Britain you're sort of dealing with at this time. But it is rather like America today, divided between two big political groupings. There are those who want splendid isolation and those who feel they have to make friends and have friends to counterbalance people. There are those who want isolation all the time and there are those who want friends all the time. And there are different views on how you manage both. Combine this with 
the 1800s, well, the late 19th century is a period of utmost technological transition and evolution. We always think that we have a ma are going for a massive period of change now. Everyone that sits there and goes, oh, the cyber age, it's so fast and so new. And then people go back and they go, oh, the coming of aircraft. The thing is, all this new technology period, yes, it does go, it's a curve like that, which is, means it's going more, gets more the whole time, curve going up and building on each layer. So it does feel like it advances further, it does. But that's always from a basis of you've already had some level of technology. If you think about computers in my lifetime alone. When I was at primary school, when I was a really, really young kid, the computers on the things, they were basically DOS and used two fingers and you hoped it did. And now I'm live casting to you using my own home computer, a little camera, a microphone, over the internet to hopefully hundreds of people. And I'm doing that all myself using one machine. That is a quantum leap. But I've always had I've always had some sort of computer and electronic device. I've had the television around. I've probably using I've had a point of reference for it. If you'd been around in the age of I don't know at the time of the Battle of Trafalgar. And you watch that century, the world changes completely from 1805 to 1905. The world completely changes because we go from depending upon the women will of the weather, of God, of all these things that, they, you know, they would use this discuss time to having combustion engines, to having systems of propulsion which do not depend upon the weather gauge. We have armor, we have weapons which can fight a, a massively long way. We have all sorts of scientific procedures, we have all sorts of development going on in glass manufacture. So many things have changed. The average house in 1800 is very different to the average house it looks like on the outside in 1900. But honestly, if you look at the average house in 1900, built of brick. The average house in 2020, built of brick. Yeah, it's got a better central heating system. It doesn't require on fires. It tends to have a radiator-based system, but, you know. Still fundamentally the same material, brick. So this is what we're talking about. The Defense Act of 1889 takes place at the end of this period. Ask her, my wife doesn't know me well. My birthday present turned up. Two books on the Russian second position squadron. The SARS Alas Armada was a top notch read. It is a top notch read. Um M Ripper Wallace. Hello, for starters. I don't think I've seen it before. Britain, the Stroppy Diva. Pretty much. Uh, you know, we had policies. You behaved. Or oh, we made sure you behaved. It wasn't nice either way. Hi, Night Heron Production. Jermak, not only technological innovation, Gilded Age, Bell Equat, late Victorian Edwardian, was also age of globalization, both economic and informational. The wonderful worldwide telegraph net. Exactly. 
when we talk about information going around the world, you have a frame of reference. Someone, if you come from 1800 to today, they'd be completely shocked. But someone from 1900 coming to today would go, well, you've got a faster version of the telegraph. That is the telegram. That's the far, that's what you've got. It's called email. Or WhatsApp. Or Discord. Speaking of which, the Discord server is a cool place to be. And I do promise I do reply to messages. Emerson, you're lucky guy. We didn't know what computers were when I was in primary school in the 60s. Um, to be fair, I had a sort of bit of a leg, a leg up on computers from the beginning. Because as I've said before in the past, my dad was the naval, one of the naval architects, in fact, one of the two naval architects who developed computer-aided design as it applied to shipbuilding. So we've always had computers around. We've always had a computer in the house. Um, it wasn't him who taught me to take a computer apart and build a new one. That was actually my sister's PhD supervisor, a guy called Eddie Bromhead, who is amazing, but I think his books are about 190 pounds a book. But if anyone here is doing civil engineering and looking into uh, landslides and preventing them, that's probably the 119 pounds you need to spend. Ian Carp, UK was strong on policing its merchant ship fleets and bases against renegade states and pirate acts. Uh, yes, it was. You can say that many, many times over. It was very strong on policing those. Uh, its version of freedom of the seas was, we're free to do it. You're not going to get in our way. You try getting in our way, there won't be anything left of you to get out of our way. Hello, better Carl. Hello, Belgium. Arthur C. Clark, yeah. Hello, Melanie. Um, Gadrian, any religion, a relation of the guy at Rook's Drift? Um, not as far as I know. Or as far as I know. Paul from Chicago, a sailor on Columbus's ship would be pretty comfortable on HMS Victory within a week or two. A sailor from Victory would be completely out of place on HMS Iron Duke. Yep. Hello, Nappy. Hello, Lucas Gents. I've come to observe I am brew consumption. <laughs> okay, well, first of all today, here's the first contact context. So, within nine years of Britain passing its law, the first German naval law is passed. The lovely Admiral of the Fleet von Tirpitz. Vessels in full commission. If you look at the squadron he's planning on building, it's fairly, you know, conservative. The thing is, when you're at a two power standard, that's going to be quite a powerful navy you're going to have to take about. Because suddenly you have to, if you're at a two power standard, you have to not only worry about who's at number two, you have to worry about who's at number three. And you also have to pay attention to who's at number four. Because a two power standard isn't really a two power standard. This is what the, the big problem with the 1889 a a a Act was. That it really, a two power standard is a lovely thing to call it, but it isn't quite what it is. Hello, Inquisitor, uh, Inquisitor Jackknife. When did Turpits die? Um, oh, good lord. I should remember that, but I don't. Let me check. Hmm. 
He died in 1930, aged 80. Poor man. Got to see the rise of Hitler. <laughs> Vision. I saw my first IBM DOS computers in elementary school when we visited middle school. Got Apple Max in fourth grade in the early 1990s. Didn't get home. Didn't get home computer until 1999. Hmm. Um, Britain, you get in our way. There won't be a next time. Eh, well, the, the the trouble is that, that you'd like to say that, but the French have been in our way a few times. The trouble is that we tend to do regime change in France, and then that regime tends to become a problem. The Inquisitor Jackknife. That is one hack of a beard. Well, first of all, hello, Inquisitor. Secondly, yes, it is. Although, mm. I, 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 you see, I, I prefer mine nice and neat rather than massive down here. Although, who knows what it gets to up the night on the night of the twenty fourth into the twenty fifth. Uh, you know, my cousins will all be wondering. But yeah. And happy. Was the Naval Defense Act not lucky in its execution as it carried? It came at a moment when technology allowed the, uh, to at least build a lot of build satisfying ocean going battleships. Yes and no. We'll get into it. So that's Germany. They are annoying, mainly thanks to a guy called Kaiser Wilhelm, who's an idiot. Bismarck is okay. It's one of the interesting things that while Bismarck's in charge, there really isn't an Anglo-German naval race. Even with Tirpitz wandering around being annoying, Bismarck never lets it get to the point the British feel threatened. And there's a reason for that. Bismarck kind of realizes that the only the that no matter how large a navy the Germans can build. The Royal Navy will never be allowed to be shrink to shrink from it. Why does Bismarck understand this? Because he takes a simple look at Britain and he goes, "What is essential to Britain's survival?" As it currently stands, it is a global empire dependent upon the sea. It cannot afford to lose supremacy of naval power. It can't. <clears throat> All right. So. RAF 4, hello. Don't worry about being late. So, that's Germany. This is what France is doing at the moment. Now, <coughs> oh, the French pre dreadnoughts. I was going to put a whole load of facts here, but someone actually summed it up earlier quite well. The French were experimenting. They were how do I put this politely? Okay. So the vessel you see in front of you was laid down in eighteen ninety one. Hang on no. Wasn't that one laid down ninety nine? He was laid down in 1891. It's the Jacobari. And they lay down two ships that year, or actually, it might, might be more than that. Uh, no, they lay down two ships in 1891. And I know, three. They do have the. Yeah. They have the Charles Martel, the Cano, and the Jacobari. Every single freaking one. 
Every single freaking one is a different class. Okay, this is not how you build a navy. This is what Britain's officially worried about, but no one seriously is worried about this. No one who actually knows how you run a navy thinks that this is in any way a serious attempt at building a navy rather than running a rather large science experiment, which is what the French navy of this period is. It's going, ooh, what can we build now? I have a new mathematical principle. Oh, whoopee day! We will go and experiment. Really? Yippee! The Royal Navy sitting watching, going. And the French admirals are going. We will tell you this is the most technologically advanced vessel in the world. The Royal Navy's going, yes. How do you get spare parts for it? We can't. Basically, France had disappeared in terms of naval procurement. How do I describe it? It is like you have a, you take a five year old. I am speaking that image at that age specifically into a candy store, and it's got pick a mix. Which, if anyone doesn't know it, is when you have a huge wall of options, and each option has its own little trowel, and you can put them in a bag, and the bag is weighed at the end, and it's all averaged out. But instead of using the trowel, what they are doing is they have decided they found a pair of tweezers somewhere. Hopefully hygienic. And they are literally going to each box and picking out one item of every single option. They aren't actually making a decision. They aren't going, this is what we need. This is what will work. They are going to every single box on the whole wall and going, one, then, then. And instead of doing filling one whole bag, they're filling lots of little bags. With this collection, in different uh, collections of these single items. Now, I don't know about you, but actually, no sensible. Uh, there is. I'm trying to think of a five year old who's ever done that like that. No, no. But it's just that is the that is what you're dealing with. You are dealing with that sort of very forensic, but very illogical mentality in many respects. Um, Jeff Hill, was Germany really higher on the Royal Navy's radar than France in Russia, in Russia in 1889? Yes, because of this point. The Germans are starting to build classes. The Germans are starting to build a coherent navy. They might not have the mass yet at that point, but like the US Navy, they have a tradition of actually building a class. There are a few individuals, but usually they try and build a class. They try and build something which you can logistically support. French. Vision France. Later French pre dreadnoughts Pretty good ships. Just late to the party, which was embracing dreadnought by that point. Yes. Calvin In 1884, France just have signed, uh, signed von Trenck's Naval Act of actually having a KK based on 15 battleships, which probably upset France and Italy. Yeah. Inquisitor Jack Knight, French name for government. Design and build all sorts of things. Yes. In Athene, I one thing. I think that up to about 1895, French heavy gun tech was ahead of the British one. Not the quick firing tech now. I would agree. Trouble is. 
So, 1890-89, the Brennus is armed with three cannon de 340 millimeters. Uh, the Charles Martel, laid down in 1891, two cannon de 305 millimeter, two cannon de 74 millimeter. Uh, the Carnot, uh, same as the Charles Martel, thankfully, but um, yeah. Managed to have different speed and different tonnage and different armor. It's just lovely. Uh, oh, the Giacomo has the same, but again has different armor, different displacement, different speed. In fact, honestly, they do manage to set as far uh, set, well, to an extent on the 305mm and 274. So I'm being a bit cruel when I'm talking. Oh, God. Different armor again and different speed. Uh, yeah, they, they, their guns, they, I, I have to admit, they do sort of standardize on to an extent, but they're just. No. And don't get me started on their quick firing guns. They're just. No. I love the French Navy for their Elan, their beautiful, inspiring design. But if you want to actually build a fleet, pick a freaking design and order more than one. And there, there is a reason they're like this. They're the similar reason as the Ger the Russians are like that. Navy is like theirs because everything is built in different yards, and every yard is allowed to do what it likes. And one of the reasons why the act that Britain establishes is quite so interesting is that it's the first time there is peacetime building in this 1889, really, peacetime building in civilian yards. And they set up the programs for how the naval constructors, the Corps of Naval Constructors and Director of Naval Construction of Third Sea Lord, will keep track of that construction. Man of 1640, who downvoted? Hmm. <laughs> so, uh, so the French Navy was a chocolate sampler. Yes, that would fit. John South. Hello, John South. The French experiments in pre dreadnoughts came at the same time as the Permont and Amsif, one of the most popular drinks in France, and have their golden age of commercial success. Maybe there was a link, potentially. James Hadley, according to the Jordan's excellent book, the Marine National battleships of pre-general era packed quite a punch on a limited displacement. The problem was they lacked squadron homogeneity. Yes, and also... <sighs> I'm going to point out a small problem, but this is a problem across all pre not battleships, really. You have your... On the French ones, you have two main guns, which are the 307 millimeters. And then the two side guns, which are 274 millimeters. Now, trying to work out an accurate long range salve with that as your firing profile is going to be fun. Let's just say that. Let's just leave it at that. It's going to be fun. In car, can you start on their quick firing guns? There is a reason you can't really see any. Rare Air 4. Wait, navies are supposed to be designed so that they can operate with one another and have standardization, which allows resupply? I know, it's it, it's a confusing concept to so many people in this period. <sighs> oh, Russia. You know what's interesting is I actually set it up so it does 11 minutes per slide. Thinking it will never get to that point, I'll always end up pressing N. I actually managed to spend 11 minutes on France. Uh, 
Uh, Calvin Gaswood, at least one, they had tertiary quick-firing battery of 100 or 130 millimeter guns, which actually outranged the main primary and secondary big guns. Yes. Yes, they did. There is so much wrong with the French. But now we're on to the Russians, who... Notice this. Double turret! Hey! It's actually one of the innovations. And one of the things which we were talking about with Drac, I think, and Bill Trump's the other day, that it's good thing when navies start, you know, developing and starting putting different ideas because it gives everyone else ideas. Construction is good. James Hadley, they also took a long time from keel laying to commissioning. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the Russian Navy. <laughs> oh, Russian. Right then. So, this particularly lovely vessel is <clears throat> the Donatstad Opolov, which was Russia's first pre-dreadnought, really. She's built for the Black Sea Fleet. Unsurprisingly, she's the sole member of her class. She is laid down in 1889. But, here is the thing. She is the sole ship of her class. That's annoying. But, I would say, homogeneously, she is actually a far better ship than the French are turning out. Because, she has four 12-inch guns in two double turrets. That's her main armament. Admittedly, her secondary armament is four single 6-inch guns, and then she's got 12 single 47mm Hotchkiss guns, four five-barreled 37mm revolving Hotchkiss guns, 10 single 37mm Hotchkiss guns, and six 15-inch torpedo tubes. But! Compared to the French one, she makes perfect sense. And she actually displaces less than they do. This is what I do not understand about the Russians versus the French. The Russians are building what are technically smaller, technically supposed to be far less sensible ships. If you read many of the books, and I'm, I'm used to reading this, you know, you get the French ships being held up as these brilliant designs, which they tinker with, and they make as beautiful, and they're innovative. They have all these things, and then the Russians are going, Russians, terrible ship. Well, actually, this one's a good one. And again, the Royal Navy is taking notice of what's being built for the Russians. Captain Seafort, thank you very much for not inflicting the image of Massena on us. Well, remember, I also have to look at the screen as well, so I have to be quite careful about what I put up there. In Happy, I guess the 1889 Act was revolution because it, for the first time the British committed to building a large class of battleships, and even then, one was a variant. HMS Hood was a variant, but it wasn't really a variant as much as you'd think. It was the British going, we are now very comfortable with this hull design, we are very comfortable with everything in this ship, we're going to try out using a turret rather than a barbette. Vision. The Russian battleship looks like a cheap version of the USS Oregon. E possibly, but she's still fairly good. Come on, Given the fire controls of mage, even when the French system were actually good, both primary, secondary, and tertiary guns outranged effective fire control. Except for against stationary targets. Well, you know, we can always hope the Royal Navy breaks down on that day, because, you know... It's not as if then and they are the navy which has homogenous systems, so probably have spare parts for their engines with them. Whereas we, of course, if we're the French, don't. So we would be more likely to break down. Oh, such a small issue. 
Name Ripper Wallace. 11 minutes on France without needing to order pizza. Well, yeah. Melee 1640. Are we too early for Aurora? Mm, I'm not really... Uh, I'm trying to avoid getting into the full Russian pre-dreadnought. Some point, I think I will do to pre-dreadnought battleships and pre-dreadnought cruisers what I did to the battle cruisers. But I'm waiting till a lot of books arrive before I do that. Many six morning. Carl, I recall hearing the French fire control was quite advanced. It was quite advanced for the period, but that meant it was slightly better than the British. Still not as good as their long range. Uh, still not as capable as their long range guns. Um, Carl, monarch class. Mm hmm. Jeff Hiller. Japanese Navy in 1889 had no battleships until they captured one from the Chinese in 1895. True. The interesting thing about this ship is it was built in a Nikolaev Admiralty shipyard. Which is in, of course, in Ukraine. Now. So, it's, um, you know. It's cool. Sean Mac, how can a self-respecting French uh, uh, naval historian describe a French pre-dreadnought as beautiful? Sean, come to some of the naval history conferences with me. You will meet some very interesting people. Jimmy, what's ammo have a problem in the pre-dreadnought? Finding a place to keep all the different ammo and making sure you had enough close to the, the close does not sound fun. No, it doesn't. It was often a problem. And it's one of the things which drove standardization of armament. Yes, Peter. What's the main aspect of the 1889 Act that it guarantees funding for future construction? We're going to get into that, but that is one of the core things. I think that at this, bit, this picture, she's got a black or a very dark green hull and white top with. Hmm, a different colour for the funnels. I'm trying to remember what the colour was, was. That's more Drax area, really. He tends to be the one who's the expert on the colours. I tend to be more specialised in the nutty, insane people who decide to build them. I think his is probably better for the blood pressure. Take care, Sir Crown. Enjoy the work. In car, apparently I can't show... Jermek, I'm sorry I can't show your picture. Ah, thank you. Sure, Max reposted it. So, buff colour of funnels. Cool. One of the best things about the ships from this area is their paint schemes. I agree. I think our, and the paint schemes need to be improved. Now, this, of course, is the Great White Fleet, and technically it's the US Atlantic Fleet, and I'm, of course, using it to talk about the rest of the world. Now, why would I be talking about the rest of the world? Why does that matter? Because... This is what's called a Jaffa cake in the UK. It looks like a biscuit. There's often a debate about whether or not it's a biscuit. But when a full-size version was baked and displayed, it had the properties of a cake. So even though it's a very small thing, it is considered technically a cake. Now, why did I bring this up? It looks like a biscuit. It's the size of a biscuit. Its packaging 
is in many ways indistinguishable from how you get biscuits. But it isn't a biscuit. The two power standard looks like a British declaration about the next two powers. It's spoken of that. It's debated of in that topic. And everyone hears that. But it isn't that. As we'll be getting into, quite a lot of this is nowhere near about its battle fleet. Why? Because Britain realizes if it ends up in a scenario where it's got the next two powers in the world ganging up next to each other, A, the next two largest navies in the world do not even have homogeneous logistics internally, let alone with each other. I think the Royal Navy expected to probably be able to beat them within five minutes. What it's more worried about is managing the world, having enough presence in the world to secure the empire. Presence for deterrence, presence for control, presence for anti-piracy, constabulary missions. So, just because it looks like a biscuit, and just because it's packaged as a biscuit, doesn't mean it is a biscuit. <laughs> Great debate now going on whether they are legally cakes or cookies. Legally, they are cakes. Legally. Hence, they're called Jaffa Cakes. And they're very, very careful about it. Because, again, because of a tax issue. But... It serves to make the point. Remember, though, when the Great White Fleet is sailing around the world in 1905, the Royal Navy has HMS Dreadnought. The Royal Navy, well, in 1805, after 1905, it has HMS Dreadnought. It has so many pre-Dreadnoughts that it could actually outnumber the Great White Fleet by having a ship either side. But the thing was, that would be the Great White Fleet sailing into, uh, up port, uh, into the channel next to Britain. That's great. But if the Great White Fleet had decided to attack British interests in the Far East it would quite possibly have outnumbered the squadron that Britain had in the Far East. Possibly. How long it would have outstirred it for... doesn't matter. Very sensibly, more importantly, how do you eat them? Well, as you can see, in one mouthful. Sean Mac, are you implying that Britain used a two-power standard to excuse building ships to counter the German fleet and the growing US colonial presence? I'm saying Britain was not looking at just the next two powers down the line. It was watching the whole world. And it also was realizing the technological changes meant it needed to change its build and construction profile. But anything it did to do that could upset the system and trigger a massive naval race. And they knew whatever building they did would trigger a race. But the question was how big and how aggressive a race it would trigger. Their handling the way they did triggered a race, but not a massive one. And then there's after eight. Yes, but unfortunately... Sadly enough, I have finished the pack of After Eights. So, it's Jaffa Cakes. I've also finished the pack of Mince Pies, but you know. I, I, I had those packs to keep me going from the beginning of the week, so it's not been ma and they're not rapidly disappeared. 
<laughs> Sad Merle, hello, for starters. The result is beautiful. I say we classified him as fruit, so I don't feel bad about going for two packs a day. Oh. Jeff Bielan, Centurion and Barfla are interesting designs intended for the Yangtze service. Mm, we'll get into those again. I will be getting into these. John Hargrave, it does not matter what it's called, it's how it reacts with the world like the 1889 Act. Sure, Matt, the British would never lie about the purpose of the law it's, uh, that it proposes, it's just like how they would never cheat on the treaties. No, we never cheated on the treaties. We just used water as armour and wrote the terminology to benefit us and all sorts of little things. Jeff Beeler, notice the Great White Fleet's absence of cruisers for scouting and screaming. Yes, that was part of the Royal Navy had worked out a small advantage against the Americans for that one. Samuel, was there any particular concern attached to the Great White Fleet by the Royal Navy when it was on his voyage? Not really, but they kept an eye on it. And you keep seeing Royal Navy ships are pottling around nearby the whole way through the voyage. And, of course, there are British colliers assisting with actually making sure the Americans have enough coal. <coughs> so, let's consider... The terminology and the phrasing of the act and all these things, they are things you don't really need to get into. Um, there are lots of caveats in there. There are talks about torpedo boats and all sorts of things. That doesn't really reveal that much because once you realize, once the Royal Navy, the Admiralty, gets its hands on 21... Hello, is that better? I am trying a slightly higher resolution than I normally am, so I'm hoping it's okay. Back, and we've successfully reconnected. No, the US didn't have enough colliers. Um, sorry, it seems to have disconnected about halfway through me actually answering some points. So, US didn't have enough colliers, so the British helped out. And for this, as I said, we get into a really, really critical point. Now, I could take you through the Naval Defense Act and we could go through it, but it's all written with such a lot of latitude to allow the Admiral to move, it doesn't really reveal much at all. And I'm sorry the, vi the um, video keeps freezing. As I said, I'm trying to broadcast in a higher resolution. I'm trying to do that. I, I, I set it up to try and do that. And I do apologize. So, hopefully it's going to work now. Now, the really interesting thing is the debate, and the debate is between these two key people. I'm trying a higher resolution and a higher bit rate, so it's trying to... Be, I, I, I managed to get it to try and work at a slightly higher rate, but it is does seem to be down at 480, and it does seem to be down at 30 frames per second now. Okay. These are the two key people for the debate. There are is the wonderful beard of the third Marquis of Salisbury. This is him pictured in 1886, so three years before the debate. He is a very conservative in his sort of style of leadership. He is... He, I wouldn't describe him as isolationist, but definitely he is. He, he doesn't want to get involved in foreign alliances, uh, ideally if he can avoid it. The same is true with Second Earl of Granville. Um, Granville George Lusengawa. They are, between the two of them, they are two of the names. Well, hopefully you've all heard of him because he ends up a prime minister. But he's only ever a foreign secretary and is usually more loud in the opposition. So 
most people, when I start talking about them, haven't heard of him, but they have heard of him. They are in really, really interesting, interesting individuals. And when I say this as an interesting, I mean, if I wanted to study and wanted a real eye, uh, interesting comparison for modern American foreign policy debates, I would look at the debates in, the, in Hansard between these two. Because you listen to some of the discourse going on in the current American foreign affairs and even in British foreign affairs as we're looking at global Britain, post-Brexit and all that stuff. It's the themes and the content and the substance and the, the, some of the stuff they're getting into is so similar in that the phraseology is different and maybe the precise context and focus is slightly different, but it is, we're going to get into this. This is really, really illuminating as to which is going where. And you can almost predict what's going to be said next and which points they're going to get to by what these two have said. Shomak, so the law is basically the government is obligated to give the Royal Navy money when they want it. The law stops it being a case of the Royal Navy, and we're getting into this, having to ask for funding each year as they're building ships. I'm hoping to get to 720 when I've got the full PC running it. I have a feeling 16 gigabytes of RAM should be able to handle it. Most people, as I said, haven't heard of Granville. He is one, and we're going to get into this debate because I will get into both of them and talk about both of them, and you will find them very interesting. Many 1640. Interesting. I know the name Granville, but I don't really know why I know it. Many of his predecessors with that title, Earl Granville, were, f well, the first Earl Granville was actually far more um, well known. <laughs> So, here it is. My lords, I, now have, I have now to move the second reading of the Naval Defence Bill. The bill has been before the public for some time, and I imagine that its provisions and the purpose with which it has been brought forward are familiar to your lordship. Still, I think it would not be respectful if I did not indicate what is the nature of the provisions. In some respects, unusual, and I think important which we have represented to Parliament, and what are the considerations which have induced us to submit them? It is proposed to apply the sum of 21.5 millions to strengthening the Navy. 10 millions of it will be applied to ships to be built by contract by private builders. 11.5 millions will be applied to ships to be built in Her Majesty's dockyards, and they will be built within four and a half years. Of that sum, we take it that three quarters is for hulls and machinery and one quarter for armament. It has been said that it is a mistake to represent this sum of 21 and a half millions as being entirely an extraordinary effort to provide for the naval defence of our trade and of the kingdom, because although the, ter the 10 millions which are to be paid to contractors will be undoubtedly an extraordinary expense. The rest will be borne on the ordinary estimates of the year and may be spoken of as ordinary expenditure. That, however, my lords, is a fallacy. The 11.5 millions which will be expended in Her Majesty's dockyards will be borne on the national estimates of the year, but it's very much in excess of what, that which could be called ordinary expenditure. 
Of course, the term ordinary expenditure is a very vague one because the measuring entirely depends on the period of time that you select as normal point, as the datum point from which the expenditure is to be measured. I do not wish to discuss what has been done by noble lords opposite, but if I may take Lord Beaconsfield's administration as a period of normal naval estimates, the case would then stand thus. In four years ending in 1879, our expenditure on new naval construction was two millions a year. In the four years which ended with the pre uh, present year, a portion of which is no doubt due to the arrangements of my noble friend above the gangway, our naval expenditure on new construction has been £3,100,000. In the four years that will end in 1893, the naval expenditure on the estimates for new construction will be £4,200,000. So that, taking Lord Beaconsfield's administration as a normal expenditure, by which to measure the estimates, there is an excess for each year of the four or five years that are coming of £2,200,000, very nearly making up the 11 half millions, which, as I have now set, have said, we intend to spend in Her Majesty's dockyards. Some noble lords present, uh, present will, of course, think that we ought not to have spent so much. I am not entering into the merits or demerits of the expenditure now, but merely putting the matter upon its proper footing. Namely, that it is an extra expenditure of 11 half millions upon the Navy. The present Board of Admiralty have made considerable changes in the traditional practice with respect to the allocation of expenditure. It was the old practice of the Boards of the Admiralty to begin a great deal more work than they had any chance of finishing in a short time, and to go on with a great many jobs in hand and to take a considerable time in finishing each job. The policy of the present Board of Admiralty has been to finish every bit of work as fast as they could before beginning any new work. The importance of that arrangement is that they are able to foresee with more accuracy what their expenditure at all times will be and to keep up a regular rate of expenditure. That means a regular rate of labour and so to employ the same number of men without sudden changes in the way of reduction or increase of the establishment. But the habit of doing a good many things one time at one time and not finishing them has been largely produced by certain treasury arrangements, arrangements which I have no doubt were originally very valuable to the finance of the country, which now have not had an advantageous effect upon the shipbuilding of the Navy. The treasury arrangement is to estimate how much of a ship will be built in a particular year, and if a less sum was then spent on it, the money had to be returned to the treasury. If more, a supplementary estimate had to be asked for. The result has been that there has been an artificial adaptation on the structure of the ship in order to suit the financial exigencies of the calculation that has been made, so that if possible, there should be spent on the ship so much in a financial year as was intended, and no more. Now, you're starting to see that the point of this bill is not so much the ships that are being built. That's lovely, but they could have built them without passing the Naval Act. The point of this bill is to change the funding methodology of the Navy. That's massive. That's changing your basis of procurement. That's changing it so you can pay for a complete ship. <clears throat> now, when you're building just in your own yards, you can get away with what the Treasury has been doing. It doesn't matter. If you're building in a commercial yard, though, you can't get away with that. The 1889 Naval Defence Act was passed by Lord Salisbury's government. Uh, I think he was a conservative. Yeah, he was a conservative prime minister. Yeah. Hmm. 
Osprey, just three million pounds. Ha. As RF four has put it, three million eighteen eighty nine, roughly three hundred eighty eight million these days money in today's money, possibly a lot more. As Melissa Ford is it? that language, it is something quite amazing, and it's quite interesting to hear someone talk in this way. It, if you're listening to what they're saying. He hasn't. He is actually revealing the purpose of the bill. He hasn't mentioned France once. He hasn't mentioned Russia. He hasn't mentioned any other nation. He's just talking about British warship procurement. He's talking about the Admiralty and the Treasury. What I find also really interesting is that three quarters of a ship's expenditure in this period is on the hull and the machinery, i.e. the engines, etc. And a quarter is on the armament. Now, in cart, if our, of all our own shipbuilding was placed to be, uh, was planned to be in naval dockyards, now, come by Nableton, uh, by 1910, the majority of ships were built in private dockyards. How are all new shipyards that ways financed? Well, here's the thing. And we'll get into this. But in 1889, the tradition of the, the shipyard Navy's productions had most been dealt with by building built in naval dockyards. This is, act is really new because it has the mass procurement from non-naval dockyards and it happily coincides uh, with a nice boom in mercantile production as well so you have more merchant ships being built and naval ships being built in shipyards and suddenly if you've got money shipyard shipyards are able to get money because they're able to build ships people start building more slips they start increasing building new shipyards incre uh, increasing the size of existing shipyards Let's put it this way. People sit there and go tell me that eight, the Act of 1889 fails because, and we'll talk about this later, there is a Spencer Act in 1894. There is a various uh, put in by the Liberal government which follows this, which actually adds more money. There is a whole range of things that, you know, the French and the Russians build ships and you know, the Germans build ships and it turns into naval race and World War One happens. All this is bad. The thing was, Britain wouldn't have had the administrative or commercial infrastructure that it took it takes advantage of in World War One to build up for World War One and to fight in World War One without this act starting it off. Think about that. But thanks to this act, by 1914, the Royal Navy had been using commercial shipyards continuously for 25 years. They'd built up a quarter of a century of working with them. A quarter of a century of increasing ship production. A quarter of a century of increasingly complicated work going through these shipyards. He doesn't stop here, though. Well, today the hull and, uh, hull and maybe some of the engines is a chump change compared to weapon systems. Pretty much. Monday, 1640. A quarter on armaments seemed quite a lot. Seems a lot, but today... Hmm. I would compare the amount of money to the amount of uh, contemporary GDP of the country. That is tends to be um, some of people's methods. Right then. He carries on. The necessary consequence 
has been that the arrangements have been artificial. It's quite damning for a prime minister to say. And from time to time, it has been necessary sometimes to discharge men because they had not enough money, and at other times to take on more men because they had, not, uh, had more money than the existing establishment could get through in the financial year. In this matter, we have most undoubtedly made a new departure. We have abandoned the practice of calculating the building of ships by bits. Besides the inconvenience it has caused, I think it has had a bad effect in relation to political influences. When the year comes round again, the plans for building ships come under consideration, perhaps before a new First Lord of the Admiralty, perhaps before a new Chancellor Exchequer, and under changed conditions, under circumstances when there might be a desire to save money, or possibly where there might be a panic, and the result has been a stretching and contracting, as if it were, of the plan of a ship with a perpetual liability to alteration, which has produced some of the strange anomalies that have been brought before our attention in recent discussions. We desire, when a ship is once begun on a given plan, that the sh uh, she shall be pushed through as far as the establishment at our command will enable us with regularity, without unnecessary intermission, and without any alterations, either financial or otherwise. Therefore, the ships to be provided by the money that is now to be placed by Parliament at the disposal of the government will be begun and carried through within a given time and without further reference to Parliament. And, without an Act of Parliament, it will not be in the power of a future First Lord or Chancellor of the Exchequer to alter the plan now adopted. The next point I have to show your lordships is what addition to the Navy this expenditure will produce. It is on the whole 70 ships, 38 of which will be built in Her Majesty's dockyards and 32 by contract. Those ships are thus distributed. Of the dockyard ships, 14 will be battleships, 20 will be protected cruisers, and 4 will be smaller ships. Of the contract vessels, 4 will be battleships. 22 protected cruisers, and 6 will be smaller vet ships. Taking into account the ships we build this year, we should be in 1894 stronger than we are now by 113 ships. That increase is specifically directed towards the increase of our cruisers, in which we found there was a deficiency. For whereas we increase our battleships from 50 to 65, we increase our protected and armor cruisers from 40 to 100. The most interesting point, however, is what is the relation of the fleet we hope to have in 1894 to the fleets of other powers? It has been laid down as a sort of general rule or maximum for the guidance of this country as a great maritime nation that we ought always to have at our command a fleet which would be equal to a combination of any two great powers which might be brought against us. I think, on the whole, this ideal start state will be reached in 1894. In that year, the armoured battleships of England will be 77, those of France 48, of Germany 40, of Russia 27, and Italy 19. If Germany and France were to unite against us, I do not think that combination is a probable one, they could bring only 88 armoured ships against our 77. If your lordships examine the details of ships, you will find a considerable number both in Germany and France put down as armoured battleships, which are really very small vessels only armed for coastal defence. But in any other combination, such as that of France and Russia, France and Italy, Germany and Italy, or Russia and Italy, in all these cases, our armoured battleships would be more numerous than the armoured battleships of any two powers combined. In respect to protected cruisers, we shall be still be stronger. There is a technical distinction between protected and armoured ships. In the former, the protection is applied only to the vital parts of the ship. The protected cruisers of England will be in 1894, B88, those of France 14, Germany 10, Italy 17 and Russia 3, making a total of 44. So England will have precisely twice as many as the other four powers altogether. That, my lords, so far as numbers go, appears to me, as far as we can make any calculation, to indicate a satisfactory state of things. I am aware that there are our naval critics who will not be satisfied with this provision, and who think that we have fallen short in our efforts to provide for the defence of the country. I have seen such views maintained by distinguished men in published articles. And I don't give a flying hoot. He doesn't say that, actually. He goes on. He's very... 
I'm gonna post a link to this uh, in. I will put it in the in the um, description down below, where you also find links to the Discord and to Patreon and to all the other things. He is absolutely hitting all his opponents very hardest, but you have to think of this. He has only. He is literally. Eight paragraphs in, finally he's mentioning foreign navies. And pretty much dismissing them. He's talking about the two-power standard, which Britain had been applying for almost 70 years by this point, arguably, and had actually reached it at a couple of points. But, more importantly than all that, he's not worried about it. He's actually admitting that on paper, even with this armament increase, Britain's not going to meet the two-power standard. Battleships-wise, the Germans and French will be able to outnumber us. But that doesn't matter. What matters is cruisers. And that is what he's focusing on. So here's the thing. Is the 1889 Act about fighting battles or about winning wars? Is it about trade con control of commerce, whether that's trade protection or interdiction, or is it about battle fleet sailing around going boom boom at each other i would argue that actually the 1889 act is commerce warfare Concentrators, British shipyards are one industry that gets direct subsidies from the government at that time. Um, not so much direct subsidies as they get ships procured on them, which is a sort of indirect subsidy. Oh, Richard, so this law is what, really? Uh, put Armstrong Ellswick in the cruiser business? This seems like quite the idea. Let's build a navy large and next two large navies combined so they cannot prevail should they join forces against us. Uh, uh, us. Pretty much. But they actually admit they're not doing that. They admit we've got 77, they're going to have 88. But that doesn't bother us because we have double the number of cruisers they have. Nick orders, and I can feel the Treasury's anguish each time one of those powers orders a battleship, the RN will be asked to match. <laughs> yeah. Inca, RN must have become even more aware, in addition to the two Navy standards, that commercial built capital ships could be acquired in anticipation of war. Yep. Captain Seifel, distinguished men in published articles, Hornby and Friends? To be fair, Hornby was actually quite supportive of this act. But we do have to consider the opposition. And this is the opposition. This is one of the reasons why I say, go look up this debate. Go look up the Hansard article. Go read it through. I will be posting a link, as I said. Um, let me just actually get the link. I've got it written down. You should be able to find the great debate now. It's it's I've put it in the chat and I've talked about it before. But this is just this is just beautiful some language used and 
Now I get to get into things. Now, Earl Granville is the opposition. I do not consider it necessary for me to follow the noble Marquess into the details, which I am bound to say he has very clearly explained to the House. But I should be unwilling to allow this bill to pass without saying a few words. I do not oppose it, but I do not think it is a bill which should pass this House in silence. The bill comes to this House backed with the approval of a large majority of the House of Commons, which is the special guardian of the public purse. And more than that, although there may be a difference in the application of the principle, both parties are agreed in wishing to see our Navy adequate for national defence. The Noble Marquess mentioned as a recommendation of the present scheme that it proposes to spend double the amount of spent in the time of Lord Beaconsfield. I quite admit that is so, but I cannot say that it is a very, any very great recommendation. On the question of expenditure, if not for the best of all possible objectives, I think it desirable not entirely to discard the opinions which have been laid down, not only by liberal leaders, but also by such statesmen as Sir Robert Peel and Lord Beaconsfield. Sir Robert Peel particularly repudiated the advantage to the country of greatly increased naval, its increasing its naval and military operations in order that it might reign supreme. Because, he said, the result of that would be that other countries would almost would follow that example, and the result would, uh, would be that each country would spend enormous resources merely in the fear of military operations. Lord Beaconsfield, on one occasion almost prayed the House of Commons in the interests of peace to diminish rather than to increase expenditure of this kind. Now the noble Marquess has stated, what will be the result of this scheme? He says that in 1894, the Navy will be equal to the navies of any two combined countries. This statement would have been more reassuring if a similar statement had not been made some time before. The government, when they came into office, I think for two years in succession, made a reduction in the expenditure on the Navy, the noble Marquess shakes his head. Marcus of Salisbury, not a reduction in naval construction. Earl of Granville, the reduction was in Navy estimates. Marcus of Salisbury, yes, but not in the Naval Construction Department. Earl of Granville, I hardly see how a reduction in the estimates can be inconsistent with a reduction in construction. The government stated at the time that our Navy was equal to navies of any other two countries in the world. The noble Marquis now provides exactly the same thing for 1894, but the fact of the statement having been made at the time diminishes it the confidence to be placed in the assurances of this, cha uh, this charter character. The government also stated at the time, in the most positive way, that it was very unwise to lay down many ships at once, for the somewhat obvious reason that in 10 or 15 years they would become obsolete. I'm not very much reassured on this point by the declaration of the noble Marquess because one of the reasons which he gave for the great constitutional innovation without precedent as to the mode of paying this expenditure was that the Admiralty were apt to change the design of their ships and to admit what they thought was in, were improvements. It appears to me that there is no such great danger as that which has been stated. My lords, the, uh, the noble Marquess has fought it uh, right at this stage of the bill, a bill which is certain to pass to raise an alarm. He made certain statements which I defy anyone to say were not of an alarming character. It is quite true that the last sentence or two of his speech, the noble Marquess rather answered himself, but it is impossible to place Faith in the picture of the danger, which he says in a very short time will we be liable to. I'm not over sanguine when I say that this picture is overdrawn. I am quite sure that we ought to do all that is necessary to make the Navy adequate, but to base it upon fears which I believe are very largely exaggerated, if not chimerical. It is not wise nor prudent. The noble Marquess has very made very little defence for the perfectly new and unprecedented course of meeting the naval expenditure adopted by the government and of taking it away from the control of Parliament. It does not, however, really take the matter away from the control of Parliament because there is the possibility of another government coming into power and if they were to have a large majority at their backs, the House of Commons might, of course, repeal. And after the bill now before us, in the case it is worth with your lordship considering whether this house would not be placed in a false position, 
I do not wish to go into details, and I have no intention to vote against the re second reading of the bill. Always interesting when the opposition hammers home blows, but is actually also holding them back. Peter Dawson. Have you read Lancaster or Richardson? I've read both. I'm a stu I was Prof Lambert was my PhD supervisor. You don't get through a PhD with Prof Lambert without being uh, having to go and read pretty much everything. Because he's one of those people you sit down and have a conversation with him and he goes, have you read? And you go, a long time ago. Well, I think it might be worth refreshing. It's... um. If you ever watched uh, the series Numbers, um, and there was this character called Larry Flynhart in it, and his conversations with Charlie Epps, very, very like what you get going on in that scenario. William Cox, if war was coming, it sometimes looks like a ma the major contractors would promote ship designs to minor powers, delay delivery, and then acquire the ships themselves on the eve of war. Um, occasionally. Constrance, my part university won't give me access to parliamentary papers on progress. The link I put up is Hansard, and it's public and able to everyone's able to get at it. Or should be able to. It's a Hansard link. They're all published online. You don't ha you you can read them for free. J. Pillar, it's too bad the cruiser designs were not better. The Apollos were described as semi submersible, and the Edgar's not much better in the heavy seas. Yeah, Bielan. The other thing overlooked torpedo gun is probably the best designed uh, battleship uh, balance designs of the battleships, other than Hood. To an extent, I'd agree with that. In car, Granville, eighteen eighty nine, comments on fifteen years obsolescence. Looks inspired with hindsight in the Dreadnought Air Age. Yep. Hello, Tian Wang. So, it's a really, really cool thing. What's going on? It's a massive debate. Ah, whenever I submit an article like that, I can't fit in what I want to say in addition to everything that everyone else has said. I have looted a Hansard for what I need, I think. <coughs> I have to say, that's one of the reasons why I'm enjoying doing um, this at the moment. I, I have to admit, my production of journal articles this year has kind of flopped because I, I've just had so many going through the system, I just got fed up with doing any more. So I concentrate on the book, and YouTube has become my journal article submissions. Instead of doing a journal article, I do a YouTube video on a topic and I get to talk about it this way. I find it fun. Tian Wang, I am Golden Eagle. Hello. <laughs> Your name's changed, so hello. Hello, <laughs> Jesus. Jeez, I'm late in this. Ah, oh, well, please enlighten me. It's going fun. I'm in 1640. Oh, yeah, let's not build multiple new ships because they'll become obsolete in the future. I think one of the realizations also in this period is the time of t the time it takes to build ships, and that's one of the problems you have: the time it takes to build a ship. It's going to be really interesting on Christmas Eve's one on twenty fourth on Thursday because I'm going to be talking about the ships built in nineteen twenty, i.e., the ships of a hundred years ago, and when you realize the pace of construction and what was going on. It makes a difference. Anyway, so I'm going to, for a few seconds, disappear while I have put it in behind this. And basically, Hansard. If anyone wants to go and flick and look at the links which are in the description or in the chat, please do, because I think you will find stuff interesting in the debate. I'll be back in a second. I just heard my voice call and my name called.
Hmm. Deleting, and I'm back. <laughs> Nishbila, what are the top naval history journals of military naval history? Um, there's Global War Studies. There's Marine du Nord. Marine du Nord are good. They actually do publish it. They just take a while to get through it. Um, journal of British Journal of Military History. There's a few journals actually. They're all quite good, but I've got. I currently have six articles at various stages of the review and publication process. One was published this year, I think, by Marine du Nord. Um, I still haven't actually seen the journal article which it was uh, journal which it was published in. I think it's entirely online. I'm not sure if it was actually published. It was supposed to be published, but I'm not sure if it actually was. COVID fun, basically. And so... I have three in second review, two first review, and I said one possibly published. And here's the thing. The one which is possibly published, it first got submitted for review about six and a half years ago. Now, there are some people who you do sometimes get your journal articles through quicker. One of them, the one, one on second review is uh, one of the ones in second review at the moment is one of the last ones I submitted. Uh, and that's bounced through very quickly. But l let's put it this way uh, I, I, I wouldn't say I was famous or anything like that. But I have noticed as I've built more of a reputation for myself in academia in terms of my conference attendance and some of the guest lecturing and the public lectures I've done. The process has sort of speeded up a bit. Finally, can you mention the sixteen forty? No forty. For Gadrian, why didn't you come back with the FRA? Well, currently the fluffy research assistants are both downstairs with my mum having an educational discussion about do not dangle from baubles on Christmas trees. It had to be given every single year after the Christmas trees put up. Every year they had the conversation. But the trouble is a bauble looks like a ball, which they really like to play with. Sorry, I'm just get a hair in my mouth. Um... Is this the 1889 Two Pass Act? Yes, it is. Can you do a video on how to fix Gallipoli? Uh, I actually might do that next year. I have been thinking about it. But I think if I'm going to do a how to fix Gallipoli, I might want to get a friend from the land side involved with it. I do have a friend who specializes in that. He doesn't have a YouTube channel. But he might be worthwhile getting involved. Juicy Susan, if you're living in a period of very rapid technological change, you have to make very hard choices about what you can afford or to try to build stuff which is upgradable. True. Mm. 
Nugus uh, Jernish, how are you getting th through so many reviews? Uh, I found the reviewer phase of my bachelor thesis really hard. Uh, don't get me started on the reviews. As I said, three are at second review stage, two are at first review stage. And the shortest first review stage it's ever taken was six months. The longest it's taken was two and a half years. Of going backwards and forward. Of not even going backwards and forwards, really. Of it going off and then me being told it will come back to you in three months time sorry it's been delayed it'll come back to you in another three months time it'll be come back to you in another three months time it just it, it's a nightmare review is a nightmare and I, I i have told my girlfriend i wish her luck for when she starts doing it i i hope she has a better experience than i do because she does she probably won't go to military history general she'll probably go to Probably some of the IR journals and media history journal journals, and I hope they are slightly quicker and slightly better behaved. So, I have talked about the debate, but I told you why I was skipping the act. The act wording itself doesn't really matter. So let's look at the ships built. Now, here are some rough figures, but there were supposed to be more and other classes added in. But I want to focus on the ships which were still going to be around for a long time. The thing about the torpedo boats is they're built, but the torpedo boats aren't supposed to be in service for a long time. No one thinks they're going to be in service for more than five or six years before you're going to replace them. They're not really considered long-term ships. So these are the long-term ships which you're procuring with an actual idea of operations in. The torpedo boats, I would say, arguably the first generation are being procured to test out the idea and the concept. Cosmos, I was told to cite my own work as I have published very little on my actual speculation. Always cite your own work because often. <laughs> what is that? Um, I have had the reviewer of one of my articles. This is one of the ones on this one of the free and second review moment. Come back uh, just sort of during the first review and say. You haven't cited Clark. This paper hasn't cited Clark on these websites. And I was sort of going, well, there's a reason I'm not cited Clark. I am Clark. Uh, so you do have to cite yourself, especially when you're the only one talking about something. <sighs> Decision. My fluffy researcher doesn't accept that she is too big for this, but she still thinks they are snack food, unfortunately. Yep. In happy. While Germany didn't succeed in outbuilding Britain, didn't they succeed in pushing Britain in various accords, alliance of other navies, i.e. losing some of their naval autonomy? The whole point of being in a navy, the British are very careful in not losing as much of the autonomy as they can, although there is some things. RF4, hopefully the PRZ book make your publisher happy and will help your publications. Fingers crossed. Timang, I feel the pre-dreads alone could have made it to, to Constantinople and gunboat diplomacy to Turkey out the wall. Despite the losses, they still have the strength on paper to do so. On paper. Jeff Peeler, it's ironic that if there had been a general war in the 1890s, the torpedo gunboat would have been a terror to torpedo boats. And a threat to larger ships with the torpedoes. It would have been. <laughs> right. So. Here is Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897. For some reason, many of the critical ships here making up the large mass of numbers are some of the ships procured during this period. I'd also like to point out something. Battleship. Battleship. In theory. Ooh. Large cruiser for fighting other cruisers. Oh. Second class protected cruisers do pretty much the most well out of this. The best out of this. 
why is Britain focusing in on the second class protected cruisers? And then you have the third class protected cru cruisers, which are, um, I have no words to describe. We will be getting to. And, believe it or not, some of these classes you might have seen before. Ben Laura, I think Massey describes the Diamond Jubilee as the height of British naval power. I wouldn't go that far, but it's certainly cute. I'd say the height of British naval power is probably 1919. But that's just me. TMN, why were they not strong enough to do it in reality? I think if you're talking about Gallipoli, I think doing it solo without having good coordinated troops ashore would have been very, very difficult. Vision, bus you can commit to spend more money on the fleet without worrying about ships being too obsolete. I think there is a reason Britain is focusing in on the second class protected cruisers. There are two reasons. One, this is about commerce warfare. And two, these ships aren't going to change their requirements as much. Think about it. These are the fighting classes, the classes which are supposed to fight other warships. This is the class which might bump up against equivalents, shouldn't bump up against superiors without the support of the others, and shouldn't ha are mostly going to be about commerce protection and commerce interdiction, i.e. commerce warfare. Look at them. They are the vast majority of numbers. So the vast majority of what they're building are the ships which are going to be least affected by those very changes of time which they were worrying about. 1916 why 1919? The German Navy was no more. The American Navy was still stuck with standard battleships. The French Navy was the French Navy. The Russian Navy was the Russian Navy, which was half Bolshevik, half white, half God knows what. Um, I would argue at that point the Royal Navy is the overwhelming power of the world in terms of naval power. So let's start off with what are theoretically the centerpieces. The Royal Sovereign's class battleships. Aye. Look at the way they, 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 HMS Royal Sovereign is keeping the seas in 1913. Isn't she pretty? Now you will notice they have Thunder Child style funnels. Always cute. They have 11,000 indicated horsepower. Lovely. They're armed with two twin 13 and a half inch guns. Uh, they're in barbettes for all but hood, which replaces them with a turret. So let's be honest, if your hood's on if you're on hood, you suddenly start to feel like you're a valuable member of the Navy. If you're in any other ones, they're sort of going, do you not care? Um, as you can see, they're built with a nice all-round fire profile. <coughs> Lots of quick-firing guns. They've got 10 single 6-inch guns, 10 single 6-pounder guns, 12 single 3-pounder guns, 7 18-inch torpedo tubes. I, I, you don't want to spend your time fighting this ship at this period. You really don't. And again, four 13 and a half inch guns. I'm sorry, but if I was the French Navy and you told me to fight one of those in one of the experiments, I would find I had an urgent need to do a revolution that day or whatever the French use rather than a doctor's appointment. At, uh, sit in at Calais. There are so many things I could be doing other than fighting this. Um, all of them would be a lot safer and better for my life. I could be literally bathing in iron brew, and that would be safer than being in a French battleship versus a Royal Sovereign class battleship.
Tier rank, not to be confused with our class of World War One and World War Two fame. No. These were good ships. Jeff Beeler, the Barbette Royal Sovereigns had end on loading. What did the hood have? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Nowhere have I seen that they change, so it might well be they had end on loading, but that wouldn't seem to fit with a turret. So you'd expect it to be breach. Hmm. Give me a second. Ba ba da ba 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 Now, Hood was, of course, one of the ones built by Chatham Dockyard. It's interesting to note, guess who builds... Uh, this is one of the things. One of the yards which gets one of these ships, one of the commercial yards, is Camel Laird of Birkenhead, which builds Royal Oak. And there's also Palmers of Yarrow. And Jane G. Thompson of Clydebank. The rest go to Portsmouth, Pembroke, and Chatham. Hood is what goes to Chatham. Now, <coughs> she has mm -hmm. She carries breech loading 13 and a half inch Mark 1 to Mark 4 naval guns. Um, so, yeah, hers were breech loading. In fact, I'm fairly sure by the end of it, pretty much all the class were breech lo were had uh, breech loading guns. Hmm, yowza! Sometimes I'm not sure if they actually had all the uh, all breech loading by the time they actually entered service as well. Decision. I think Britain's naval peak was arguably earlier, but this was a key moment in maintaining dominance where they properly laid out how they understood their power and how they felt they'd use it. Mm, possibly. Vision. First class Imperial Star Destroyers versus second class Imperial Light Cruiser. Yep. That's one of the th interesting things in the current uh, Mandalorian series, although I actually haven't watched the Mandalorian series. One of the interesting things that's come up and I keep seeing about is the fact that the Moff Gideon, is, I think he's going around in a cruiser. And everyone's going, oh, it's so weird. He should be in a Star Destroyer. And he's sort of going, logistics, size, all these things could make going around in a Star Destroyer quite difficult. Whereas actually going around in a cruiser, that could probably be perfect for that point. Especially when you realize know, Star Destroyers are battleships in this world. They haven't just called them dreadnoughts. <laughs> Nick Water, so she's pictured in 19 and 13, that'd probably be her final cruise. Yep, I think it was. Sun Kits, hello. Uh, Royal Sovereign photo looks to have Victorian colour scheme, so photo probably pre-1904-5, when boring overall grey began to be applied? No, I think they kept them. I think these battleships kept them to the end. 
Benora, Temera, Majestic Nelson, Hood, and Vanguard are pretty siren battleships. Mm. Jeff Hiller, still on Royal Navy's books in 1897, pioneering ironclads, Sultan, Hercules, Bellafron, Swisker, Triumph, Audacious, Invincible, Iron Duke, and Monarch. Hmm. In Happy, the turrets were mounted on the same pear-shaped pear uh, barbet as the Royal Sovereign class. Yes, they were, which possibly caused some trouble. Uh, Dinwang, how did they resolve the balance on Hood? Armoured turrets high up must have been a pain for stability. They tried to make them lower, which is what made us semi-submersible. As Zinappi says, she was cut down a deck uh, down a deck before and aft. It wasn't good. Carmen Gasbert, Star Destroyers were called Imperial Cruisers in 1977, uh, Star Wars Episode 4. That would have made so much more sense. But they didn't keep it. I would call them dreadnoughts because let's be honest, that's what the Star Destroyers were. There are some really big ones, but they were dreadnoughts. Anyway, so, as I pointed out several times, there are some interesting things. You have the Centurion class. Now, Centurion class are also battleships. Well, hey. And you will notice something. That is a turret. <gasps> it wasn't just Hood which had a turret. And it gets even more confusing, especially if you're the French. Because the Centurion class are theoretically light battleships. And they're supposedly for the China and the Mediterranean fleet, um, with Centurion usually serving as the flagship for the China station. And there are all sorts of different ideas about them and what they're going to get up to and what they're doing. However, I think a lot of the stuff misses it. So, we talk often about second-class battleships, even third-class battleships. But second-class battleships is often hard to explain what their role is. And I would argue that a second-class battleship's role is to be able to hoover up armoured cruisers and anything smaller than it. Hang on, what am I describing? A ship designed to hoover up all cruisers smaller than it. Mm. But no, such a revolutionary design didn't come about till... Well, you know, 1906 with the Invincibles, did it? Hang on. There were the Razé frigates built towards the end of the Napoleonic era, which were designed to go around and hoover up the frigates and cru the frigates, the cruising vessels of other navies to protect against commerce warfare. Where am I deploying them? Mediterranean. That's a key spot for sending ships into the Indian Ocean or sending ships into the Atlantic or in the Mediterranean to deal with trade protection and and deal with commerce raiders. And oh, the China Station as well, where, again, I need something powerful to turn up, but not that expensive to run. And I need to have a presence. Second class battleship, not designed for the battle line unless absolutely necessary. 
but actually given proportionally for the time far better armor than the next generation of ships which would be built with the role of hoovering up cruisers. In many ways, it was filling the role of the second-class battlecruiser, which is what sold the death nail for the battlecruiser. Yes. Meet HMS Barfleur and HMS Centurion. They might not be as fast as you associate with the idea of a battlecruiser, but you have to understand that at this point, the idea pre-radar, pre-aerial reconnaissance, pre radio really functioning long range, most of commerce protection and counter commerce protection was going to take place, um, commerce interdiction and commerce protection was going to take place at certain nodes around the world. Similar nodes as had governed warfare in, sail, in the age of sail. And in the critical nodes, if you had one of these wandering around, you would shortly find that any armoured cruisers which wandered across its way wouldn't be existing. Decision. I'm partial to Leanders and Amphibians most, but do like Nelson and Splendid Cats and post refit rounds. Hmm. Old Richard, my source indicate breech loading uh, 13 half inch Mark 1 guns on the Royal Sovereigns. They were originally, I think, were designed for muzzle loading, but I think you're right. I think by the time they were all fitted with breech loading, by the time they actually were launched. Jeff Elam, Centurion has a hooded barbette open at the back. Eh, it gets interesting. Yes, you would call ISDs dreadnoughts, but the Admiral Kuznetsov's honestly cruisers and the Ismos are helicopter destroyers, honest. Mm -hmm. In the 1890s, Centurion really has no equal in the Far East until the Russian Japanese battleship served, hence the 1902 treaty with the uh, Japanan. Yep. Uh, Hood would work well with Trafalgar class and Admiral class battleships in the Med and other of all and Ryan clads. Jeff Hiller, why was Barfleur based in the Med and not closer to the Far East? Because the Med is a great place to be able to go either way. It's why does the Royal Navy made a ma maintain a Mediterranean fleet in the 1920s and 30s instead of basing a fleet in the Indian Ocean? Because you can in have a lot of infrastructure that can support the fleet in the Mediterranean uh, in peacetime, cheaply and cost-effectively, because it's not that far away from home, really. But you can rapidly deploy it from the far to the Far East there. So basically, consider it forward basing a quarter of the way around the world, rather than half the way around the world. In Happy, do you consider the Canopus class a kind of second-class battleship? Uh... That's something which I'd like to do a video about, the Canopus class. So, yeah. Now let's go to the Edgar class cruiser. Now, we've all heard about their various issues when it came to rough seas. Yeah, they had them. But they were a first class protected cruiser, and in many ways the first decent first class protected cruiser that the Royal Navy built en masse. They're rather cute in some respects. Again, look at that firepower. Two 9.2 inch Mark VI guns. Ten quick firing 6 inch uh, guns. Twelve 6 pounder guns. Four 18 inch torpedo tubes. This is not a ship which even as a battleship I would really like to run into. In fact, if I could avoid her, I'd be positively giddy with the idea of it doing so. However, please note that there is a bit of a French, a French about her in that those are single guns mounted forward and aft. Yeah. 
And again, going back to the med question again, uh, don't forget, as Bitron points out, don't forget the Suez Canal. Makes med a very strategic place for a navy that controls the canal. It does. It makes it useful. Jehila, second class battleships in reserve. Inflexible, Dreadnought, Edinburgh, Colossus, Fondra, Devastation, Alexandra, Ajax, Agamemnon, Neptune, Superb, Temeraire. Yeah. In Happy, Barbette hoods on Centurion open at back because at time building she still used B BP charges. Oh. Oh, no, they, I think at some point they do actually fill them in and turn them into turrets. T9, well, China's copy of Kuznetsov, Shantung, the province that the Sing Tower is in, is honestly designated as an aircraft carrier. I know. I'm glad. Many 18 inch torpedoes. Yeah, four torpedo, 18 inch torpedo tubes. In Happy, would you prefer twin 8 inch as considered over single 19.2 inch in cruisers? I prefer twin 9.2 inch. Dear, seriously, the rate of fire between an 8 and a 9.2 inch is negligible in difference, but the impact of a 9.2 inch is quite useful. So if you're going to have one or the other, might as well have twin or both. Edgar's, uh, goes with the Edgar's could actually sail with wind and sails. This is often discussed, and I think it is sort of viable, but those re those masts really aren't that great for that. So, yeah, I'm not going to base too much effort on it. The, some of the smaller ones could, definitely, probably. Um, Jeff, yeah, the Igor's 9.2 singles were chase guns, but would have been better, would have better have been Better replaced by six inch guns mounted on the deck higher, especially at the bow. Uh, no, actually, I think having 9.2s is useful. As I said, I just wish she'd had a couple more. I think the 9.2s are useful on a cruiser because, especially on an armor first class protected cruiser, because they are a statement of power and they mean that anything small new has got to think about those before it gets involved. Because it may be able to avoid this, it may be able to avoid them, but it's got to think about them before it gets involved in the fight. And even if you're something larger, you've got to think about those. It's kind of like the 18 inch torpedo tubes, you have to think about it. Why did the RN abandon 9.2 caliber post uh, post uh, Lots of debates. Lots and lots of debates. It mostly comes down to logistics. Jeff Pillar, the Warspike class were the last large cruisers to have sails and they were quickly removed. Really? They're good ships. They are good ships. Yeah. Apollo class. And these are some of my favorites. They really are very, very cool little ships.
Okay, so back in. Their whole balanced approach actually provides them with a whole lot of firepower. Again, they have the six inch guns as sort of chase guns, as we talked about in the Edgar class, but they have the 4.7 inch all round firepower, and this gives them a whole lot of capability. These are very, very balanced ships, and that's the important thing. They are incredibly balanced, versatile weapon systems. Okay, go through the questions. And as I was basically going, they can go boom, boom, boom all round. So whichever angle you're coming from, you're going to get a lot of firepower pointed at your direction. And very quickly, they can maneuver to bring more guns to bear. And you start to realize very quickly that the second class cruiser has a role in both fleet actions and its commerce protection role. Because all those 4.7 inch guns they are great for dealing with torpedo boats. That is what they're there for. Torpedo boats and torpedo boat destroyers, that is what they're there for. Apollo class is half the RCN. Yeah, potentially. Okay. St. Kitts, did the depth of the Suez Canal play any part in our battleship design, tonnage draft? No, it was um, a lot deeper and a lot wider than the uh, Panama Canal, so it had less of a stricter on the British. Vision, if I was China in the late 1880s, I would have built a pair of mini battleships on a large belted cruiser hull with two twin 9.2-inch guns on the 6-inch battery midships as follow-up to, uh, to, to German ironclad. Hmm, could have been good. Come on, guys, um, eight inch shells, r roughly 200 pounds, 9.2 inch shell, roughly 380 pounds. Yes, Eway, not really man mobile, so mm. it's logistics. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, right, yeah, sorry, I managed to hit that somehow. I must have done this, somehow whacked it with my elbow or something, I don't know. Um, what was the uh, constant average? What was the UK coming to the US ABC cruisers? Mm. Well, the U.S. Navy is sort of building these protected cruisers, and I would argue that they are sort of aiming at the first class, but they sort of fit between the first and the second class. So I would say sort of the Edgars and the successors to the Edgars, which the U.S. Navy is aiming for, but I would say they're sort of straddling the first, second class area. And here is the Estrella class cruiser. Also cute. Very, very cute. Um, how good were the Shen Yun class? Let's have a look. Let's remind myself about the Shen Yun class. Tingyun. Um, honestly, not that bad. They're a, they're an attempt to get something, but. As interesting as the ideas they are, I, I, I would say they are paying for someone else's experimentation. Anyway, yesterday a class. 
also second class protected cruisers, but this time they're armed again with two quick firing six inch guns, but eight 4.7 inch guns, 10 quick firing six pounder guns. So they are pretty much dominant when it comes to small ships. You don't want to be around them. And for SARS, one is still still in service. Astre of HMS Fox is still in service in 1919 and is covering the former Russian battleship. How can a small ship of this size cover a battleship and actually give confidence, considering her age? Well, she has four 18-inch torpedoes, tubes, and the torpedoes were loaded, and a little maneuvering of the ship, and they would have been brought to bear. Jepila, Australia is a more seaworthy Apollo. Um, uh, honestly, you have to agree with that. They are bigger. I would. Mm, it, it, you start to look, sort of look at them and go. Uh, basically, the Australia puts on seven foul, uh, seven hundred and sixty tons, but its length only grows by six feet. They're a fun design. They really are a fun design, and they're a capable class. Inca, British yard built ships supplied to Japan, South America, and Turkey. Pre World War and state of the art ships taken straight into the RN. Well, most of them were fairly capable designs. They wouldn't have actually bested probably most of the British ships being built at the time, but they would have bested most ever peoples. Jeff Hiller, Australia's are what the Apollo should have been. Basically, better sea boats with more firepower, but only free built. Uh, yes, but I would argue that the Australia's then have a far bigger impact on their successors. It goes sort of Apollo's, Australia's. And after them, there is the Eclipse class. And they have nine ships and they're really nice and then you have the arrogant class uh, the arrogant class and after that the Pelarus class sort of The Eclipse class are really quite some quite beautiful ships. Admittedly, they have five six inch gun, the quick firing six inch guns on them, and six quick firing four point seven inch guns, and six quick firing three pounder guns. All right, no, eight 12 pounder and six three pounder and three 18 inch torpedo tubes. And then after 1905, they have more build up. They're just, they're just full of fun, these ships. But I'd say Apollo provides the numbers and then Astrea provides the, the technology going on. It provides the sort of the idea going on. In 1640, you find our bow stern guns unimpressive. Perhaps our broadside torpedo on it will get your attention. Pretty much.
And then you have, and I know I've mentioned these before in a previous discussion, the Pearl Class. Oh, boom, 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 boom. Yep. Two and a half thousand tons. Honestly, eight quick firing 4.7 inch guns. Please don't come up against anything which is actually a fighting warship of the enemy, but probably capable of dealing with most armed merchant cruisers that were conceived at the time and were designed to be a design quickly ramped out around the world to provide presence and basically <laughs> their sloops. Okay, basically, that is a sloop. There are many other people who would go, oh, I'm not sure, but it, it, by interwar standards, that's a sloop. In today's parlance, that would probably be a slightly upgunned version of HML River class. Mentally sick of Any of this is nine and a half thousand horsepower. Ah. If we go back to the Australia class. Okay. So they would get between seven and a half thousand horsepower to nine and a half thousand horsepower, depending on whether they were in natural draft or force draft. Which affected their hull their hull performances. And um Eight cylinder boilers using free uh, powering three cylinder turbine engines developed seven and a half to, between seven and a half to nine and a half thousand horsepower. And yeah, they're just and it was deployed through two shafts. It, uh, it's a complicated engineering system in there. Let's just leave it at that. It gets quite, when you're reading some of them and you're going, um, that doesn't, that, 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 does that, that work? Does the, you have, <sighs> basically my idea is that each engine is a three cylinder engine and it's using two of them. And I think it's got two three cylinder engines on a turbine, but some, Sources claim it has three single cylinder engines, and I don't think that works. And some it has one three cylinder engine driving both paths, but I think it's got two three cylinder engines. Oh, yes, turbine is there. They are VTE. Um, Australia class. No, three cylinder turbine engines. And to be fair, where is my book? I have my, my, my book is around here somewhere. Um, do, 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 I don't think that covers early enough on that one. I think it's the other book. Where is the other book? I can't see my brassies from that period. But I know I was reading it for this. I can't also see my Institute of Naval Architects from that period, but I also re was reading that. But no, they do have turbine engines. A three cylinder turbine engine, I think. Two three cylinder turbine engines. Let me just go through. I know turbines don't have cylinders, but these ones are described as that.
Hmm. I have to look it up again, but that was literally what was written, and I said, when I looked it up, that was what they were describing the engine as, a three-cylinder turbine. Jeff Hiller, the Pearls would have come to the German light cruisers and colonial duties. Could go toe-to-toe, 4.7 -toe, versus 4.1 inch. No. Well, yes, you could in theory, but in practice you wouldn't want to. I said, free cinder. It's not a typo, it's what I... Mm-hmm. No. Oh, let's see if it is in that one. I think. I don't think that class is makes it into here. So a Strayer class. I think they're in the other book. Yeah, they're in the other book. So not in here. No. I'll look it up again. I'll do a long patrol on these ones. Uh, there is the Norman Freeman's Victorian era cruisers. One, which I helpfully cannot find in front of me at the moment. And I was reading it this morning. These ships were built in the 1890s, so, yeah. I do agree, turbines don't have cylinders, but it looked... As I said, it was in the book I was... Honestly, I admit, I was copying it straight out of the book. Trusting the book, but... And that's got me into trouble before. Free cylinder would fit a triple expansion engine. Yeah, that would be, but I'm wondering. One of these classes, and I had an experimental. They tried an experimental engine for them at the beginning, and then they changed. So maybe, maybe. We'll see. The Australians do have three, four, six, nine of them built. I don't know, three, six, eight, eight of them built. So they do, they do quite a lot with them. Anyway, so let's get into the results. Danny Phillips, how were the guns supplied? Protected cruisers? Was it a case of hoists, ammo parties, or unlockers, or something else? It was a, there were lock, usually ready-use lockers, but there was also 
hoisted systems for the main guns and ammo parties for the subsidiary guns. Right, so the result of the 1889 Act. What happened? Well, did it work financially? It depends. Uh, as you can see, this lovely um, resolution shows that actually they had to put a further 1.3 million for the completion of the equipment of ships under the Naval Defense Act of 1889 in 1893. But, combined with a surge in mercantile production, combined in a surge of warships being built, it helped the economy massively, and it helped rephrase naval construction. You no longer had bit building going on. You were actually building whole ships. And this actually had the effect of making the ships more easily to easier... Uh, more simple to predict the cost of. And also, it made judging their quality better. So, I would argue economically it has a lot of very good and beneficial impacts. And it certainly does make the Navy work better. So that's the important thing. Domestically, well, here are the words of the Earl of Lethrim in 1889, also as part of the debate. My lords, I desire to say a few words with regard to the construction of vessels intended for the mounting big guns. My might point comes in upon what was said by Lord Harris with regard to the carrying of guns. In my position, sufficient guns have not been ordered, and I think sufficient provision has scarcely been made in the scheme of the government for the supply of ordnance. In regard to the one of fast cruisers, I would point out that in the case of necessity, we have already vessels available in the ocean-going passenger liners, and I believe the Board of Admiralty are not going far enough in the direction in which foreign powers are going, that is to say, providing armaments for those ocean liners. I have been informed that such great foreign companies as the Messengers Maritimes and other large companies sailing under foreign flags actually carry in their holds large guns ready to be mounted at a moment's notice. I think that guns should be carried on board our large ships and ocean liners, and also that encouragement should be given for their carrying men who have been go who have gone through a course of training and who are therefore be qualified to fight those guns in emergency. I believe, my lord, that is the direction in which the Admiralty might add strength to the naval defence of this country. So, I would love to say that this was the only example of this, but this debate actually happens during this debate. And it carries on. So, you know, we always portray as fake news and the worrying level of discourse and the privatization of war and some people believing some random stuff they see somewhere and actually thinking it's true. Well, it's nothing new. Let's leave aside the reality of starters, in which this person is proposing on putting on much ocean liners big guns. How big a gun? Where would they have the ammunition? How would they mount these guns on the ship? Where would they be carried? There are so, so many questions to this. The actual practicality of fitting it. We'll leave to one side. Carrying the ammunition for it. What kind of merchant company is going to want to carry around the world the sheer weight that you would need and danger of having guns and high explosive and 
propellant, let alone the shells, the propellant as well, all below their decks in their hull. And they've got to carry guns which are big enough, which they themselves can fit, because where are they going to find a yard with a crane to do the work for them? What neutral country is going to go, ah, yes, Mr. Ocean Liner, you've arrived. You want to have guns, so your guns fitted, you're carrying inside you. I didn't realize you were carrying guns. Are you actually a warship? Yeah, then we can't do it. There's a treaty. Or that would be supporting and aiding you, and that's going to make the Royal Navy come after us. And then there's the concept, I suppose, in this particular person's mind, that those ships would have a chance in any scenario of actually being able to fight a proper warship. So, no, I'm not sure which dragon the Earl of Lecheron was chasing that particular day. I'm not sure whether he had had, I don't know, more drugs in his system than the orange one has, or whoever's keeping Biden going. Um, but no, it just no. <sighs> mm -hmm. Jeff Peeler edited the Australia's Wikipedia entry and changed turbines to vertical triple expansion as Conway's pre eighteen sixteen ninety six. Yeah. Where did I get it from? I think I got it from Friedman's Victorian book. Hmm. We'll find out. In Abbey, Friedman, Amethyst was the turbine trial ship. The first uh, ship larger than the destroyed, so powered. 192 ordered gem class. Hmm. Hmm. Minute And Enemies are wasting valuable cargo space to hide guns being mounted at a moment's notice, and they have trained crews for them. Yes. How do you stop them turning pirate? Keydron, there is always an interesting possibility. There is always an interesting way. Jeremac, 19th century. Why can't we make ocean liners cruisers? 20th century. Why can't we make airliners into missile carriers? Oh, good lord. Dr. Clark, this was the 1880s, so it's quite likely to still have low explosives propellant and not high. Mmm. Maybe, yes, okay, yes, low explosive propellant, but still, do you want it in your merchant ship? As I said, you had the high explosive for the uh, for the shells, and then you have propellant, which could be low or high or something in there. It just, it just you don't want it. Yeah, feel like I will check Freeman. Hmm. I'm wondering where I got it from now. Because I remember looking at it thinking, is this right? And then thinking, it's written here, and I'm presuming this person knows better than me. <sighs> hmm. Because interesting enough, of the classes which we discussed today, the ones I know the most about and what they got up to in the world was the Pearl class. But no. Fun times. And internationally. Oh, <laughs> I have to say, these last slides really did worry me. Internationally, it well, announced to the world that Britain was actually there and what it was prepared to do. 
France and Russia unfortunately matched the construction and it lays the groundwork for the Anglo German naval race. But as I said, it does boost British trade and production. And it actually means that Earl Spencer has to produce a program that's the Liberal government in 1894 of more ships. It's just fun. And I am going to say, because I want to put up some more lights this evening, that I'm going to finish this one at 9.30. Mainly because I've got to put up, I want to put up some more lights. My 18, 18, 1898 Jane show knows no turbo and cruisers. So I have no idea where I picked it up from. I presume I picked it up because of what Jeff has said from the same place as Wikipedia. Helpful to know. wonder where the Wikipedia guy got it from, because that would tell me where I got it from. Because I'm fairly sure it must have been from one of three books. Hmm. Vision. In Mark Twain's Yankee in King Arthur's Court, the modernizing American from the future fails to reform medieval England, gets defeated despite a worshipful army uh, armed with Gatling guns. How? Many 16 of Audi. Conflagration of Killerton Range supplies of Prem are always fun. Especially when a passenger sneaks into the wrong compartment for a smoke. Oh, yes. William Cox. Everything went to in a handbasket when they started using those breach loading naval rifles nobody needs punk anymore my home industry is at risk <laughs> uh how did the german fleet financing work to the point where it went bankrupt how is the navy separate from the treasury uh, they pass laws and the treasury doesn't have a choice about funding it and the laws don't always have to have the support of the government which is having to pay for it they have to have the support of the Reichstag and the Emperor, the Kaiser. Thanks. Could you give us some quick hints as to what you would do for Drax's current competition? A few tips for each nation, to be fair. Uh ooh. What's the current competition that he's announced? What's the latest one? Because I, 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 I could be one or two ahead. Jeff Peter, Freeman just says the Astrias have the same engine as Apollo's. Mm. Which means I probably got it from one of the older books. Interesting. I'll have a look up and find out where I got it. Ian Happy, would you prefer larger Blakes to cheaper Edgars? Um... I do like the Blake class, but... They had to try the Edgar class to get to the powerful class. And the powerful class are cute. And then there comes the Diadem class, and they're just cuter still. And I'm, surprisingly enough, I'm not as keen on the Cressy class. Mm. 
Mm. And then there's the Drake class, which are just a whole load of firepower. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting ships. I would probably, on balance, due to their deploy, uh, if I had to pick, I'd probably have gone with larger Blakes, but... Mm. Which one is that? So I'm not telling you something that's not public yet. <laughs> Vision. If I was trying, I would say that two centuries of humiliation at best have been overcome by successful monetization. Monetization. Be nice to um, everyone for trade reasons and focus on conquering space. Hmm. It's Thompson. Well, it's still here. Got to go home from my mum says hi. Hope your day going well. And good one you for the lights. It's that's one of the reasons why I'm going in three minutes, so I can put up some more lights before it's time for doggy bed bed. I think this is one I need to rewatch from the beginning. Like some standard amount of good content to put out. Well, I'm gonna go and check up those where that engine stuff came from. And as I said, this is was already gonna become a long patrol. And I will make sure I've clarified that point for the Long Patrol and worked out what's come from. I have a feeling Jeff Beeler is right and has spotted something which I missed because I was just copying it out. Because I was just trusting that someone else knew to... This is the trouble with being a naval historian and doing these things. There are lots of things about this which I do know in quite a lot of detail, but there are, of course, bits which you don't know as well. And sometimes you rely on your sources, and sometimes those sources lead you wrong, sometimes they lead you right. Uh, but I, as I said, I have a feeling Jeff is right now. And to be honest, I just presumed it was one of the, it was the Royal Navy playing around with engines at the time, because there is something called a free cylinder turbine. And it's the idea is that you would have free sort of turbine, uh, free turbines in sort of separate cylinders with the gases coming in, and so it's sort of three separate fans turning the shaft. It's actually it's an interesting idea, and it. I have seen it tested, so I was presuming that the early troubles with turbine engines, they just tried this methodology, but I could well be wrong, and I'm fairly sure now, quickly looking at Wikipedia on the individual ships that I just flicked through, which I probably should have done earlier, I should have probably checked Wikipedia, uh, they have got triple expansion engines, so... I'm guessing I copied that little bit out wrong. Jimmy, I like Cressys over any of the first class protect other first class protect cruisers. They were just not good North Sea ships. Agreed. They're good ships though. Emery Wallace, hello. Dr. Clark, must say thank you. Being affordative and good accompaniment accompaniment for DIY in Portsmouth. Enjoy. You said these were early 1890s? Turbina was 1894. So they can't be turbine engines. Yes, but... I think you're, as said, you are right, Mally. Um, I was writing it down. Chef Thompson, I'm glad I was able to say. Carhaman, I'm back. All the first class protect cruisers had design flaws. Trying to build too much for the technology at the time. The Estrias were the best design. I would agree with that. Which is possibly another reason why I wasn't... It's going to sound strange. They were so good, and they, they were so good, it just seemed, sort of seemed fit to me that they would have better engines.
Cosmos, how many can actually call you out on it? There's only a few books written on each topic. Yeah. But I don't mind. When I get stuff wrong, I get stuff wrong. And I said, I have a feeling I was wrong on this one because I feel my the source I was copying from probably was wrong. But I'm not going to... Uh, I now have a feeling I know which book it was. And it's one of the older books. And I will go and check it again because maybe I copied it out wrong. So I'm not going to say which one. I said my instinct first was that it was Freeman's. But Jeff has checked Freeman's, so it probably wasn't Freeman's. In which case, it was another book, and I want to go check it before I start saying that that book's written it wrong. Because it could be me. I could have read it wrong and typed it up and just presumed it was right. There's always a possibility of human error in case of me. Audition. There are three sane servants, but they are not cylinders. Hmm, yeah, but listen. Interesting times. Vision. I saw three ships come sailing. <laughs> Jeff Hina, my bad too. Only three Australians make it to World War One, but eight, a total eight were built. Yes. They were good ships. And as I said, I will see you all on Christmas Eve, where I will be doing ships of 1920. Cox, don't worry, Doc. Uh, <clears throat> Jeff Hina, I think a bad Wikipedia entry was. Well, that's the thing. I didn't check Wikipedia. If I checked Wikipedia, I'd have it. So I think Wikipedia got the same source I did. Oh. I, it's one of those scenarios where I should be saying I should have checked Wikipedia. Because what I always do with Wikipedia is I always check the individual ships, not and the class registry on the ships to just check they're all the same. So if I'd gone and checked that, I'd have seen, because I've done that while I've been online, I'd have seen that the ships had triple expansion. So, because I didn't do that, I got in trouble. So, mm, yeah, should have checked Wikipedia. That's going to be used against me by my students at some point. I know it is. <laughs> ah, well, life's a sale of me. When Cox, no worries, Doc. If we're all that easy, we'd all be the historians. Yeah. Anna, take care, everyone. As said, I'm off to do some more lights. So, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Thank you to In Happy, Melanie sixteen forty, Ian Carr, Jeff Beeler, Greg Swarovski, Constant Drowsiness, Old Richard, Vision, William Cox, Tian Wang, or Golden Eagle, uh, Golden Dragon, I think. Yeah, Golden Eagle, I think it was actually it was Golden Eagle. Yeah, Jeff Beeler, Calvin Gasberg, John Shea, and Sadmiral. Take care, everyone, and Paul from Chicago. Um, Sean, Ian Carr, Nick Walters, everyone, thank you very much for being here, and thank you very much for being as helpful as you have been, and hope you enjoyed it. And as I said, there will be a long patrol come out on this topic where I will confirm that what you probably already know, I guess, that I was wrong on the tur uh, fruit turbine thing for the Estrellas. Sorry. And um, take care. But also, in the Long Patrol, I probably will go into a little bit more detail on some of the baits and stuff. Because I've got some other stuff, but I didn't want to put it in the live because it would just be me talking for too long for a live. I like to be able to answer the questions, so I limit the things. Anyway, take care, Carl Harmon. Take care, Adrian Ford and Lucas Janich and Adrian. Take care. My sixth morning. Dr. Clark, you're human. You're allowed to be wrong. You get the big details for us, and we'll check the simple stuff. Thank you. RF4, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Take care, and Merry Christmas if you don't manage to make it on Thursday. But I hope you do, because Christmas Eve, we'll be going through all the ships that entered service in 1920. And that includes the glorious, the one, the only, HMS Hood we all know and love. Take care.